So now I'll go ahead and introduce our author. The Right Reverend Mark Hanley Andrus, PhD, is the eighth bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of California. Raised among the hills and rivers of East Tennessee, Bishop Mark developed an early love for the beauty of God's creation and heard a call to help protect it. As Bishop of California, he leads the Episcopal Church's delegation to the annual UN Climate Conference, COP, and serves as presiding Bishop Michael Bruce Curry's representative to the Anglican Communion Environmental Network. Bishop Mark's advocacy work also includes immigration reform, LGBTQ plus rights, and racial reconciliation. He is the author of the critically acclaimed book that we're all here to celebrate, Brothers in the Beloved Community, The Friendship of Thich Nhat Hanh and Martin Luther King Jr. He is also the co-author of Stations of the Cosmic Christ, which he wrote with the Reverend Dr. Matthew Fox, activist and theologian. Bishop Mark lives in San Francisco with his wife, Dr. Sheila Andrus. Thank you, Bishop Mark, for being here. I'll go ahead and pass it to you uh, to begin the reading. Thank you, Jess. Uh, it's so um, always a joy to be with you, Jess, and you do such a great uh, luminous job of welcoming everyone, and uh, I've, I'm grateful to you. It's great great to be with all of you from all your wonderful places and um, around the world and, and close at hand here, some Berkeley folks and uh, Alabama folks in uh, Australia. You folks in Australia, I had an extraordinary experience. There's a um, Australian Benedictine who uh, has sight impairment and uh, he and a friend uh, got on the phone every week for I think eight weeks and his friend read the book to him. Um, and then he wrote me a long, um, a long email with questions uh, about the book. It was, and then we uh, communicated. Um, he did voice recordings, and we I recorded some answers back. And um, yeah, so it was a beautiful experience. Um, well, I'm going to start. Uh, so Jess has suggested that uh, there'll be about 15 minutes of reading from the book, and then. I'm going to talk for about the same amount of time about how did the book come to be? Um, what was this process and the uh, the journey around this book? Uh, and then we've got um, a long period of time to talk together about questions you have or observations you have. Um, so, um, so I'm just going to, uh, Sheila and I have, uh, um, not the San Antonio Sheila, but Sheila Andrus and I have marked uh, quite a few passages in here, and I'll tell you where they are um, and just read read some of them. These are passages that um, represent discoveries that came through the research or were particularly beautiful and meaningful from Ty's writing or from Martin Luther King's work. Uh, so we're, we're going to start with um, a, just a paragraph. Um, from the introduction. What would it be like to live in a place and time wherein humans experience the world as both full of meaning with each person, each being, a plenitude of beingness, each full of infinite wonder and beauty, and also as a world deeply interconnected. Such is not the world in which you and I were raised. Indeed, this enchanted world has been eroding for the last 400 years. Today, when the depths of an individual being unfolds before me, and when the world shows its marvelous interrelated reality, I feel surprised, as it is such a contrast to the mechanistic, alienated world that is often our daily fare. And then uh, more from the introduction that connects to that. Changing our perception, changing our inner landscape, nurturing the seeds of goodness within us, these acts change the world as truly as any other acts do. Referring to the climate crisis, the Emergence Network has posed this question, what if our perception of the crisis is the crisis? Put positively, by changing our perceptions, the fruit of mindfulness, 
we are making positive contributions to averting the planetary climate crisis. More general awareness of mindfulness and its importance is the gift that Thich Nhat Hanh has given the world to aid in building the beloved community. Today, the United States is a divided country, one of many countries experiencing bitter, deep, and seemingly insurmountable divisions. We are divided over the treatment of immigrants from across our southern border. We are divided on race. We are divided on the reality of climate change. Whole regions of the country view other regions as being populated by people whose views are incomprehensible and indefensible. At a more intimate and smaller scale, families are divided, not able to speak freely on these polarizing issues with each other. In many cases, families are ruptured, relationships broken. And yet, the deepest desire of the universe is to connect. So said the late geologian Thomas Berry and cosmologist Brian Swim in their groundbreaking book, The Universe Story. We can feel the truth of their statement that we want to connect with one another, with the earth, and for many of us, with the source of meaning, the divine. And yet we live in a world that is so broken, so marked by rupture. Our fractures create suffering whose scope we have difficulty in plumbing. Can we overcome the gulfs that divide us? Is there a path to healing, becoming whole? I have come to believe that a way to fulfilling our deepest desire, the desire of the universe, the desire to connect does exist. This healing way can be called repairing the beloved community. And then, this is um, a famous quotation that all of you know, uh, I think, but it was so guiding to me and so important. Um, then I came across the following statement from Thich Nhat Hanh made in 2014, before the massive stroke that has robbed him of speech and the ability to walk. I was in New York when I heard the news of his assassination. I was devastated. I could not eat. I could not sleep. I made a deep vow to continue building what he called the beloved community, not only for myself, but for him also. I have done what I promised to Martin Luther King Jr. And I think that I have always felt his support. The statement was a thunderclap for me. Numbers of questions came forth, the central ones being, in what way was Thich Nhat Hanh building the beloved community? And what did he mean that he felt King's support over all those years? Was that simply a function of memory or by reading King's sermons and books? Or perhaps Nhat Hanh meant something about the ongoing presence of great beings who have died. In this last regard, I also wanted to know what it meant that Nhat Hanh told King in Geneva that in Vietnam, they call you a bodhisattva. Okay, um, one of the sources that I used was a beautiful journal that Thich Nhat Hanh uh, kept and was published uh, called Fragrant Palm Leaves. And it, it covers the years in the early 60s, both in Vietnam and in New York and in Princeton. And it's so personal. Um, it, it's such an intimate window into Thich Nhat Hanh's um, humanness and his spiritual qualities, both. And it, it, it makes him very different than the later very, very famous Thich Nhat Hanh, who always had a sense of humor and, and was um, able to relate on the horizontal level. But, but his fame made him, I think, for some people, a little more than human. <laughs> and, um, and these really show him as a very young adult struggling um, in Vietnam with the movements that he was starting around peace, around uh, empowerment for uh, peasants in Vietnam uh, and and being alone in New York. Um, so these are just a few um, excerpts from Fragrant Palm Leaves. The Nhat Hanh who speaks from the pages of Fragrant Palm Leaves is not a two-dimensional image of a Buddhist monk, serene and unshakable, 
Nadhan is moved by beauty, particularly of nature, of plants, mountains, landscapes. He is touched by the kindness of friends. He feels loneliness and aches for his home country. Nadhan is so heartbroken by the opposition he and his fellow reformers and social activists experience from the Vietnamese Buddhist hierarchy that he becomes dangerously ill, fevered, and unable to eat. And this is what he wrote. We felt lost. Our opportunity to influence the direction of Buddhism had slipped away. The hierarchy was so conservative. What chance did we, young people without position or a center of our own, have to realize our dreams? I became so sick I almost died. So I left the city to live in a small temple in the Blao province. Our other friends also scattered to the winds. It felt like the end. Then he describes being overtaken by inner spiritual battles in which he is battered and left tattered and devastated. Sometimes I feel caught between two opposing selves, the false self imposed by society and what I would call my true self. How often we confuse the two and assume society's mold to be our true self. Battles between our two selves rarely result in a peaceful reconciliation. Our mind becomes a battlefield in which the form, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness of our being are strewn about like debris in a hurricane. Trees topple, branches snap, houses crash. These are our loneliest moments. But when such a frenzied hurricane strikes, nothing outside can help. I am battered and torn apart, and I am also saved. I passed through such a storm this past autumn. It began in October. At first, it seems, seemed like a passing cloud, but after several hours, I began to feel my body turning to smoke and floating away. I became a faint wisp of a cloud. I had always thought of myself as a solid entity, and suddenly I saw that I'm not solid at all. My true nature, I realized, was much more real, both uglier and more beautiful than I could have imagined. And finally, Nahan is visited by beloved figures who have died in his past. The full moon of October, my mother was with me. No doubt she had followed me to the temple as the moon was first peeking over the horizon. As I listened to the sermon and then to Kimioto's music, the moon shone on the temple roof and now it followed me home. My mother died six years ago on the full moon day of October. The midnight moon is as gentle and wondrous as a mother's love. For the first four years after she died, I felt like an orphan. Then one night she came to me in a dream. And from that mom moment on, I no longer felt her death as a loss. I understood that she had never died, that my sorrow was based on illusion. Now, I'll, and there's some more excerpts, but those are enough to show how, how beautiful and tender uh, that is. One of the most striking uh, areas in the research that comes into the book is around um, the letter from a Birmingham jail, one of the great pieces of literature. So we're moving to uh, Martin Luther King. And in, in that letter, as you know, he describes to a group of uh, white clergymen in Birmingham, um, mostly Christian, one rabbi, um, the process in, in, in the midst of this letter that has so much passion in it about the movement. He also explains the process uh, by which he and his uh, co-workers planned nonviolent actions. And one of those pieces is called Raising the Tension. And that leads to something, uh, I think, like a, a kind of breakthrough in Martin Luther King studies uh, that that was part of this book. But I want to describe raising the tension. One of the most intriguing and instructive parts of the letter has to do with a nonviolent strategy of quote, raising the tension. Raising the tension is the opposite of can't we just get along or an appeal based on the idea that we are all people of goodwill. Instead, the nonviolent practice of raising the tension seeks to make people uncomfortable, to prod them out of their easing, comforting ways. To raise the tension is to put matters into stark relief. Raising the tension is acting like a horsefly, inflicting painful bites in order to wake the somnolent animal up. 
King credits the Greek philosopher Socrates both with the tactic of raising the tension and the vivid metaphor of being a pesky gadfly. In Plato's Apology of Socrates, Socrates is defending himself before a jury composed of Athenian citizens, all men, chosen by lot in a trial for his life. We might expect the philosopher, if we didn't know him better, to throw himself on the good graces of his peers, men he knows well, but he does not. Instead, Socrates is deliberately insolent and boldly critical. He is, he tells them, their last best chance at being a better society. He compares Athens to a lazy horse and says that he is the horsefly appointed by the gods to afflict them into wakefulness. This is from Plato. Now, therefore, my fellow Athenians, far from making a defense on my own behalf, as one might suppose, I must make it on your behalf to prevent you from making a mistake regarding the gift that God has given you by condemning me. For if you put me to death, you won't easily find another one like me, literally, even if it's rather comical to say so, attached by the God to the city as if to a horse that, while it's large and of good stock, nevertheless is rather sluggish because of its size and needing waking up by some horsefly, just as such. It seems to me the God has attached me to the city, the kind of person who wakes you up, prevails upon you, and reproaches each one of you and never stops landing on you all day long, all over the place. In his letter, King makes reference to that passage from Plato. I just referred to the creation of tension as a part of the work of the nonviolent resistor. This may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly worked and preached against violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension that is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, we must see the need of having nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will men to rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. So the purpose of the direct action is to create a situation so crisis packed that will, it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. Uh, so then um, we move forward to one of the most well-known ways that people um, connect the relationship between King and Nat Han, and that is uh, Dr. King nominated Thich Nhat Han for the 1967 Nobel Peace Prize. If you uh, do an internet search on Thich Nhat Han and Martin Luther King Jr., you will find literally hundreds of articles that start with that, uh, and that's about all they say, most of them. But they, many of them, say that King made a mistake. They say that um, by nominating Thich Nhat Hanh publicly, he violated the rules of the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, and that disqualified uh, Nhat Hanh from receiving the, um, the award. No award was uh, granted that year. They, they didn't give a Peace Prize for 1967. There's about six times I went through the history of the Peace Prize all the way back to the early 1900s. It wasn't the first time or the last time that no prize was given, but it was rare. And most people say that King just didn't understand the rules. Well, that seems highly unlikely to me. Uh, rather, I think this was an example of raising the tension. He made a public... Uh, letter, an open letter, uh, which is what he did with the letter from a Birmingham jail that was written to six clergymen, personally to them, but it was published in the New York Times and, and all over the world so that the focus, the attention of the world was on these clergymen. Would they do the right thing? In a similar way, I think what King did by writing an open letter to the Nobel Peace Prize Committee was raise the tension and put the put the uh, tension on them, a public uh, notice. Would they do the right thing? Uh, in the middle of a war between the United States and Vietnam with uh, strong forces on both sides, would they be brave enough to give the peace prize 
to a person who's been exiled from his home country, but it also represents the enemy for many people in the United States. So um, here's a little bit about that. Um, the nonviolent action theory that King inherited from Gandhi, Musti, and others, a theory refined and deployed with Glenn Smiley and Bayard Rustin, included this notion of creating such a crisis and establishing such creative tension. The letter itself is an example of constructive nonviolent tension in that though its primary addressees were prominent white clergy in Birmingham, it was a public letter. Publishing it as an open letter, we must imagine placed enormous pressure on these clergy. Their dinner conversations were surely filled with tension. If King had written them privately and confidentially, these Birmingham clergy might have chosen to ignore King. Once we place King's public nomination of Nat Han in the company of the letter from a Birmingham jail and other nonviolent actions that he led in the civil rights movement, we can surmise that King was seeking more than to honor Nat Han and their shared goal of peace between the United States and Vietnam. Additionally, King was raising the tension in the international community, calling for courage to risk the displeasure of both the communist allies of the Viet Cong and the Western allies of the United States and to stand for peace. Viewed in this way, King's public nomination of Nat Han for the 1967 Nobel Peace Prize is far weightier than the suggestion of an honor to a person he may have admired from afar. King is acting in the kind of loving solidarity with Nat Han as he acted with his friends in the civil rights movement. So there's a whole lot more, but I think I'll just go to the conclusion um, because we're time is moving along. Um, how do I understand the beloved community and the religions of Nat Han and of King, Buddhism and Christianity, respectively? Nat Han has said that he may know the Buddha and Jesus better than many people who lived in their circles during their earthly lives, for he goes on, he visits Jesus and Buddha every day. It is sure that Nat Han visits both of these great beings not to worship them, but, as the late Marcus Borg said, to follow them. Borg was writing only of Jesus, but the same holds true for the Buddha. Maybe better even than follow, we might say, befriend. The Sangha and the body to which the Buddha and Jesus pointed are both ways of speaking of the beloved community. An interrelated, peaceful community held together by overflowing love and compassion. The beloved community is cherished by Christians and Buddhists under other names, but neither religion, in fact, no religion, possesses the beloved community. If you are part of a religion, please stay loyal to that religion or that philosophy, but make it transparent to the beloved community. See the beloved community shimmering in its nearness within your sacred rites and in the loving circles of others who share your faith. If you are outside of religion, do not feel any pressure to become part of one, but please respect your spiritual self, your inner self, and nurture it with all the love and creativity you can muster. And for each of you, save some of your energy, your intelligence, your knowledge and wisdom, your bodily energy and skill for the work of repairing, building, and maintaining the beloved community. Okay. There's so much more I'd like to share with you, um, but here's the good news. We're celebrating the, the launch of this audio book. <laughs> so you can listen to the whole thing and maybe some of you have. Um, it's, uh, I'd like to describe then the process of uh, this book and then this audio book as well. Um, I was a graduate student uh, in the doctoral program in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness at the California Institute of Integral Studies. While I ha am, have been working as the, um, the very full-time job of being the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of California, and I did this by taking one seminar course per semester. So a seminar course there lasts three hours um, once a week, 
I would walk from Grace Cathedral up on Knob Hill through the Tenderloin, um, a really uh, challenging part of our city where there's a great deal of unhoused people, um, people dealing with extreme poverty, with drug addiction, with mental illness. And um, I would make my way from that beautiful, beautiful place up on Knob Hill uh, of such privilege through that world to CIS, which is a, a private university, and uh, take my place with other um, young and older philosophy students and our professors and spend three amazing hours each week. I did this for seven years and then walk back up the hill through the Tenderloin again. Uh, and that was part of the, the spiritual discipline that I wanted for this. But the whole reason I was in the doctoral program was to deepen my capacity for meeting the climate crisis that we're in. I, I felt that we have been placed on this earth at this moment when there's still a chance, although it gets smaller every day, to turn back the worst effects of climate change for all of life that comes after us and even life that exists now. And while I've been working along with my wife, uh, with Sheila, who is a ecological entomologist and international public health uh, expert, who's been working on all this for many decades, I've been working in this area for quite a long time. I felt I needed to be better prepared. So that's why I was in this um, doctoral course. And I had a whole dissertation uh, topic picked out and I had written about a hundred pages on it. It was a completely different thing. And then I learned in a, a course taught by Drew Dellinger, who did his PhD dissertation at CIIS on the mountaintop years of Martin Luther King Jr. and, and Martin Luther King Jr.'s cosmology, about this relationship between Ty and Martin, which I didn't know anything about. And I was just thunderstruck by it. And uh, at an Easter party in my offices at Grace Cathedral, where some of my professors, Robert McDermott, um, and some of my co-students, uh, um, Becca Tarnas and Matt Siegel were there. And I, I described to them my dilemma of wanting to do something with this. And Parallax had, Parallax Press had already heard about my interest in this a relationship between Ty and Martin. And they said, they'd be interested in in a book coming out of it and I said I don't know what to do I don't have time to do all this and they looked at me the three of them and said it's obvious drop the other dissertation and start over so that is what I did I had to redo some research I needed some other courses to take and I started researching um, their relationship and I came to believe from that quotation from 2014 that it was much more than a convenient um, and important um, mutually supportive relationship to end the Vietnam War, that it was, it was much more than that. And um, so it became a, a deep journey. And um, as you know, in the fall of 2018, uh, Thai finally went back to live in Vietnam in Hue, the holy, the imperial city, the holy city, the in the monastery where he had taken his monastic vows as a boy, and um, you know one of the innovations and, and really important areas of uh, enlightened um, in Buddhism that he engaged Buddhism that he brought forward was ordaining women, and he restarted his whole practice of ordaining women in Vietnam. Um, when he returned to Hue as a person who couldn't speak, who couldn't write, who couldn't walk. And most of my days, I, so I went, um, I, I connected to the communities, they invited me to come. Um, I spent a, about a week and a half in Hue, and I would bicycle every morning at 5 a.m. from the hostel, the hotel where I was staying, um, it was June, it was 92 degrees at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> uh, and I would get there and do walking meditation, chanting, walking meditation with the nuns, um, and then do chores with them and have lunch. And then I did interviews with, um, with the nuns and with the monks in the afternoon and was able to meet Thich Nhat Hanh uh, several times. And it was really powerful to be uh, with him 
one of the young women, I, a teenager herself, um, one of the young nuns said to me, uh, maybe the third day I was there, it is a privilege to be here when Thai is conducting a revolution without words. And by that, she meant the gender reconciliation that he was uh, effecting by reestablishing the practice of ordaining women in Vietnam and in Thailand, uh, he did as well. So that um, uh, the, the senior nuns, including Sister Chan Kong, were so gracious with me. They gave me probably 15 hours of uh, recorded interviews. Um, Sister Chan Kong is, you know, his closest and longest associate um, and a remarkable um, Buddhist teacher and practitioner in her own right. So that was um, a big boost in the um, in the research. Um, and I finished my dissertation and defended it. Um, and one of my uh, professors on the committee was uh, Dr. Clay Carson um, from Stanford University who established the King Center there and was asked by uh, Coretta Scott King to edit Dr. King's papers. So the, the volumes, the five volumes of um, King's papers were edited by Clay. Um, in my online, because it was in the middle of COVID, my online uh, defense of my dissertation, my three professors came back and uh, Clay said, I did not think after more than 30 years of studying Martin Luther King that I could learn anything new. <laughs> and your book has taught me something new about Martin Luther King Jr. I was so overwhelmed by that. Um, but then the work of turning a dissertation into a book that people would read began. And I started working with an editor, Jacob Serpin at uh, Parallax. And we worked very closely together for about a year. Uh, and that was, I thought that was going to be easy. That was not easy. <laughs> I had to really basically rewrite the whole thing. Um, language and um, what we would share from a much larger dissertation into this book. Um, we, we got along beautifully. He's a wonderful editor. The people at Parallax were amazing uh, altogether. And in November of uh, 2021, the book was published. And um, then the audio book uh, became a thing. And that, uh, I'll finish by saying how special that was. So Parallax reached out to two recording studios here in San Francisco. One of them was out in Seacliff, which is, um, if you do, if you know San Francisco, it's um, it's towards Land's End. It's very dramatic, beautiful landscape. The waves um, sort of outside the Golden Gate are pounding against these rocks and it. There's, there's the extraordinary homes and uh, some of the old rock stars uh, from the 60s had their homes out in Seacliff, um, like um, people from Jefferson Airplane and Jefferson Starship. And uh, I, think, I think some of the Grateful Dead lived out there for a while. And now it's sort of billionaires uh, that live, live out there. And the other one was in the mission. And it's called Different Fur, F-U-R. <laughs> and I just thought I'd rather go into the mission than Seacliff. Uh, but I didn't know anything about it. Um, it's the oldest recording studio still extant in San Francisco. And it opened the year that um, Martin Luther King was assassinated, 1968. And uh, inside, there are all these gold and platinum albums from Stevie Wonder and Herbie Hancock and um, just an amazing part of the musical history of San Francisco. Uh, over the recording sessions that I did there, it was only myself in the studio and a re uh, recording um, technician who was from a Vietnamese American family. And her parents had been a part of the boat people refugees from Vietnam who had been helped by Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, it was just an amazing, thing and i and i the experience of reading this book which i had written um, i listened jess and i both said to each other we listen to audiobooks i i love it it's a completely different experience than reading my imagination um is provoked awakened in a way that is slightly different more vivid than um than reading 
um, than reading it. Listening to it's uh, a, a different experience for me. Reading my own book actually was very emotional. It connected me to Ty's words, to uh, Martin's words, to the things I had written and, and memories that I had in new ways. And I found myself becoming very emotional during the reading of it. Uh, it was it was a wonderful experience. Um, and then finally, I will say that, that um, I've been a teacher for many years. I, I taught in an Episcopal uh, boarding school as the chaplain. I've been a person who preaches and teaches in person for many, many years. And I love that intimate interaction between people. Writing a book that people read, uh, that many of them, most of them, I will never know and never hear from. But as with the Benedictine uh, Australian, when I do hear back from people from all over the world and, and from near at hand as well, it's, it's a completely um, new experience for me uh, to, to find that this story of these friends and the beloved community that's a third figure in this, if you will, a third character in this uh, story have helped them and that it this story has inspired them it's it's really remarkable and then their own stories uh, the things that that they share um so i i love it and i've got um, a whole bunch more books that i want to write now <laughs> um and uh, so i think yeah we have about uh 20 minutes just on time how about that and we can take um questions from you or comments and um we have we have time i was a little bit late in in attending so if i if you address this please forgive me but i'm curious how you came upon the title hmm. um that's a great question and uh you know i didn't cover that justine so thank you for asking um I was struggling with a title. Um, you know, every every choice, like the cover of the book, and uh, is a is a important choice in trying to convey a message. And I wasn't sure that. Well, certainly it was more than just a um, allyship, right? They they weren't just allies. Um, they didn't just help each other. And friends um, is a good. Um, is a good word, but it seemed deeper than that. It seemed more familial. And so uh, honestly, I put the question out to my family <laughs> and our youngest daughter came up with the title. <laughs> so um, so I think that the relationships in the beloved community are so intimate, even uh, filled with peace and with love. And they they more resemble a family than they do um, what some of us think is friendships. I mean, I hope that each of us have, have a friendship that has that truly loyal and deep quality, those friends that last our lives. And, um, and yet, and, and some familiar relationships are not so close, of course, this is the truth of things. Um, but anyway, I, I, I hoped that it would evoke the sense of your best relationships, um, those that that are most loyal, most full of love, and that help each other uh, become what we truly are more. Thank so, you. And I think it's a great title, by the way. It's very, yeah. I, I like it a lot. So thank oh, you for good. that explanation. I'm, I'm glad. I'll tell my daughter. Thank you, Justine. And this, I see... Um, my Australian family. Hello, I'm really enjoying this. This is wonderful. Thank you for your time. Um, what I'd like to know, when you were with Thich Nhat Hanh and Sister Chen Kong, and when you were in Hue, um, he, he wasn't verbal, but he must have made his, um, he must have been able to communicate with you in a very special way. You've obviously got deep feelings for him and he must have had these too. How did you how did you understand him? How did you come to sort of understand what he was meaning without any verbal things? Well, hard question actually, because 
I'm so used to words. You know, I'm a person who lives in a word. <laughs> I, I live by words so much. Um, and, you know, what I said, the young nun said, made me really think um, that he was conducting a revolution without words. And how did she understand that? Like, how how was he influencing? Well, he was ordaining. Okay, I get that. But how else was he influencing them? So, as I said, we did walking meditation each day. And it, it was with the nuns. I would walk with them. The, the men did their meditation separately. Um, and I hadn't, it had been about three days that I had been there, three or four. And um, it's ironic. It's it's the humor of the universe. As I said, I was bicycling there. It's about two miles uh, in 92 degree heat. And I was dressed like this. I, I wore my clergy, um, you know, I wanted to be respectful because they're all wearing robes, right? <laughs> And I wanted to be respectful, but I was soaked in sweat every time I arrived uh, every morning. So that day, I decided that was like a bad idea. So I packed these clothes in my backpack, and I had on sort of bicycling clothes or running clothes. And suddenly, we're in walking meditation, and there's this commotion. Um, I'm near the back of the uh, the walking group. And uh, Ty had joined us. Uh, he had come to be with us. He couldn't walk, but the brothers were, uh, one brother was pushing his wheelchair and he had indicated to them that he wanted to come. And what they told me, what the brothers said was he wanted to meet me and to do walking meditation with me. So we walked together. We just walked side by side or he, he was being pushed and I we were side by side. And then he invited me through them back to his cell in the monastery next door. And um, I just, I simply expressed my gratitude for how he'd influenced my life and the life of so many people. I told him a little bit about this project and then we were just quiet together for minutes, uh, not not hours, um, but 15 or 20 minutes. And he just looked at me with those beautiful eyes. And I just, okay, so I felt loved. Um, and it was a just a feeling of strengthening and uh, embrace. And um, so that was June of 2019. And in October of 2019, I myself had a stroke. And it was, a, it was a pretty massive stroke. Um, and I was in my office in, and my staff had gathered and we were having our weekly staff meeting on Monday morning. And I couldn't, um, suddenly I couldn't talk. I couldn't move. And um, we were praying. Everybody's eyes were closed. And it's the first time in my life I hoped that the prayer would be short and people would look up and see that I was in trouble. But the other thought I had was, this is Ty's reality. My mind was alive. My mind was working. I, um, I had no impairment of thought. I simply couldn't move. And I couldn't express myself. And I thought, this is his, his permanent existence, um, to, be, to be like this. I am among the 10% of people who have a stroke who don't have after effects. And I feel very grateful. And I had a near-death experience uh, in the emergency room where I felt my life being given back to me and my powers of expression and so on. But there was a deep connection in that time when I couldn't communicate with, with Ty. And as you know, he, he died then. He transitioned the next, um, next late winter um, after that. So, uh, so <laughs> it's... It's hard to put into words because because it's sort of beyond words. Um, but but thank you for asking. We have a question in the chat uh, in the Q and A box from Laura, and the question is: Can you share more about your source material? Um, great. I used. Um, 
all the existing source material between the two of them. So there's the, um, the nomination letter for the Nobel Peace Prize, the original letter that uh, Tai wrote to Dr. King asking his help. Um, there's the statements that Tai made around the time of uh, uh, in 2014 about his, uh, there, there actually he made quite a few statements about the importance of his relationship with uh, Dr. King. I used um, quite a few books of Tai. So as you may know, if you've read the book, uh, he Tai wrote a play and the play is very important. And um, I had been told by the former um, publisher uh, at, at Parallax that it had never been produced. It appears that it has been produced one time and maybe only one performance. And the uh, Thich Nhat Hanh Foundation has given me the, I, I just want to tell you all, the rights to produce this play. I am determined to get this play out in front of people again. It's a very important play. Yes, I'm so excited about it. It's about the afterlife. And specifically, I argue in the book that it's about the life of bodhisattvas when they have made the vow, the vo taken the bodhisattva vow, what happens when they're mortal lives, when they transition out of this mortal life. And it, it's so that that was an important book. And then No Fear, No Death goes with that play. I think it talks a great deal about, about death. Um, and then his he had two books that specifically worked on the relationship between uh, Christianity and Buddhism and between Jesus and Buddha. I used those books um, as uh, probably about a dozen of, of Thai's books, uh, including uh, his first uh, book that got published in English, um, Lotus in a Sea of Fire, Vietnam, Lotus in a Sea of Fire, very important book um, in which he describes his own uh, form of Buddhism and the history of Vietnam. And Parallax has just brought out a new edition of Vietnam, Lotus in a Sea of Fire. I did most of my research uh, here in San Francisco using resources from the San Francisco Public Library. <laughs> and I wrote um, probably half the dissertation in the local branch of our library. I ordered a Vietnam Lotus in a Sea of Fire from the public library. I got a first edition and it had all kinds of notes written in Vietnamese in it. It was, it was um, passionate. There were people who considered Thich Nhat Hanh kind of a traitor, that he was a crypto communist. They were circling things in the book and um, it's an amazing uh, artifact. For Dr. King, I used um, many of his sermons. Um, of course, letter from a Birmingham jail, uh, his I have a dream sermon, his uh, I've been to the mountaintop sermon, uh, writings, um, his last published book, which very important book, uh, uh, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. Um, so those were a lot of the sources. And then the interviews uh, were incredibly valuable. I learned things from the interviews that no one in the world, um, essentially outside of that small circle of Sister Chang Kang and Sister Tiet uh, Nhiem and others know, um, like what they said to each other in Geneva and um, about the beloved community and, and about their love for each other. Um, so that was very precious, um, the, the, the direct uh, interviews um, as well. Okay, I see Tanya is asking about Dr. King's family to this book. I, I have no idea. I don't know if they know that it exists. Um, as I said, uh, if you were here earlier, Dr. Um, Clay Carson has had a, was one of my professors on the committee for the dissertation. He's been very positive about it and um, was very close to Coretta Scott King. But of course, um, um, yeah, so she, I don't have any idea if, they, if they're aware of it or not. Um, I'd be I'd be interested to know. Thank you so much, Bishop. This was really just very right on time and very um, encouraging and illuminating, especially um, in this moment. Um, I knew a bit about the gadfly analogy, but the imagery of 
a pesky fly that people just want to swat away um, really resonates because that's really been the last sort of few years for me as I've had my own spiritual awakening and been very vocal about um, my values that I guess people interpret as political, but are really just the spiritual journey that I'm on. Um, mm. I wanted to ask when you, um, sorry. It's okay. It's okay. When you described Ty's journey of feeling like he was dying, yes. going through this really, really rough period, it made me think of the past two years of my life where I was evicted three times in three months. No family would let me stay with them. I was quiet fired twice. I was just losing it. And I know now that this is part of the gadfly journey of people wanting to make an example of you so that you just break and just go back to keeping everything okay. apathetic and comfortable for people. I guess I wanted to understand that journey of like those stations of the cross, right? That you cross over and it's no longer about this mortal life. I, I have no attachments to this life um, after having those multiple deaths and the betrayals and the public humiliation and all that. I'm so invested and wholly invested in the journey that the universe has me on no matter what it costs because it costs me everything, but I'm still here, right? Um, I guess I wanted to know what resources were available or if you knew, knew of any specific doctrine, be it Buddhist or Christian, that speaks to this sort of dying to the world um, and those sort of punishments that happen materially um, that are supposed to sort of keep you in line and keep you from what is what God is doing in your life. Um, I mean, I know about obviously in the Gospels, um, those sort of... Uh, narratives in, in in the gospels about jesus but i wonder just uh, that just came up to me when i thought of you that story about ty because there were moments where i was like i'm mm -hmm. dying i'm not going to survive this and mm -hmm. in fact after having crossed over not only mm -hmm. have i survived it i've never felt more emboldened and more right. um right. sort of courageous because once you survive the things that are supposed to kill you 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 know that you're going to be uh just fine bigger so um, yeah you're thank bigger you. than they are well, I am very moved, as you were, by by what you're saying and by your witness and your life. And I want to encourage you. Um, it is, of course, costly. It is uh, deeply costly. And I think um, what I could say is two things. Um, it puzzles people that Martin Luther King would approve of the letter that Ty sent him when they their first contact, which was centered on the self-immolation of uh, the monks and nuns, starting with Thich Quan Duc. Um, and so most people saw those as suicides. And King did not say that. He understood it. They made a joint statement that these, this was they were martyrs. And so even one of my professors said, I just can't buy it. I, I just don't see that. Why could King see it? Well, I think it's because following Jesus, which he did, he believed that you just take each faithful step and it just takes you further, um, and may I say, into the sights of the empire. So the more you take a faithful step forward, the more you become an identified gadfly. And uh, so when you read his sermon, his last, Dr. King's last sermon, the night before he was assassinated in Memphis, I've been to the mountaintop, you see that he understands that he's going to pay a price for this faithfulness. Now, I... Uh, Ty was just equally as committed, um, and he did not self-immolate, and he was not martyred. But I think he was totally prepared to. So that's that's one thing. In other words, um, he, uh, Dr. King, A.J. Musty, and others have all said you cannot seek martyrdom. You cannot. You cannot. It, it becomes something else when we when we are you know, it's despair, it, it does become suicide, or it becomes ego. 
And so one of the principles uh, that besides raising the tension and the gadfly that I discuss in the book from the letter from the Birmingham jail is purifying our motives. So they worked so hard in the movement, in the civil rights movement, to make sure that their motives were clear and, and unshakable, like the way you are. Um, you know, so I, I would say all that. Also, this play that Ty wrote, I recommend reading the whole thing if you have a chance. Um, it's published in one of Parallax's books, um, Love in Action. And um, that was re reissued too, wasn't it, Jess? Um, that one will be coming out in January. Okay, excellent. And, uh, you know, it's funny, uh, Sarita, that it's in there because it's not like anything else in the book. It's this play at the beginning of the book, and the rest of the book is essays. Um, but the play takes place at the end of a historical event. And you may have read this already in, in my book, but what happened was a young uh, Buddhist nun had self-immolated in late spring, and then, you know, that Thai started a school for social work um, to teach young Buddhists to be engaged in the world, not to, you know, simply seek alms and do works of, um, of charity, but to learn how to help people change their lives and, and move out of poverty. And there were four of five of these young men staying in a dormitory uh, near the Saigon River and they were, it, they had gone to bed in their dormitory and uh, armed gunmen came in and they they abducted them and took them down to the riverbanks and, and shot them and killed them. And one young man survived. Uh, they didn't think he was alive. He was in the water. Um, they thought he was dead. So he was able to tell the story of what happened. So that's the historical piece. The play starts at midnight that night. And Mai, the young woman who had died a, a few months before, rows a boat to the shore of the river, to the banks of the river. And the four young men who have died, who were shot, get into the boat with her. And then they start rowing. And they have this discussion about what is the afterlife? And what is the purpose? What do we do? In the afterlife and you realize uh, as it goes on or at least i argue that they're not talking about just anybody <laughs> uh, who dies but rather people who have gone so far along the path of overflowing love in their current lives that whether they're buddhist or whether they're christian or whether they have no religion at all they are in fact bodhisattvas so what what thai is arguing is that our lives will, will go on, that we cannot be killed, that love cannot be killed. So St. Paul says this too, right? Uh, three things endure, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So, um, you know, it's a frightening thing to be in the, um, to be threatened, uh, to be uh, opposed, to be betrayed. Um, these are frightening things and they're real. Uh, and I would never lessen them uh, and i and i, I again i uh, you know the uh, a person self immolated a year and a half ago in the climate cause and um do you you know the work of arandati roy the um the great yes, yes. you know so she's so amazing and um she's a novelist of course the god of small things but she's also this great indian activist and probably 20 years ago, she wrote an essay that I thought was so important. And she said that the powers of India, the business powers and the political powers have learned that they can ignore the hunger strikes of indigenous people who were uh, whose land was being flooded by these big dams that were being made. Now I'm saying this because what she is saying is that some of the techniques that worked at one time in, in various nonviolent movements no longer work. And we have, to, we have to find new ways, more creative ways that will help us today. So I myself think that um, we can see that several self-immolations have happened and I don't think they help. 
Uh, they, they're they not changing people's minds. And I, I just don't, you know, I cannot be someone who recommends them. And um, at the same time, I, I believe it's almost like the arms race. In an arms race, it's not nonviolence versus violence, it's violence versus violence. Somebody comes up with a new armament, new technique or new war technology, and it, it gives them an advantage until the other side finds out how to overcome it. Well, what we're gonna have to do is the same thing with nonviolence. We're going to have to identify new methods that will help um, help convert people, help wake people up. Um, and I don't know what those are. Uh, I, I've been thinking about it in the climate context. My Hindu friends, um, like in the Bhumi project, uh, they are advocating a plant-based diet. Okay, that sounds kind of small, but as you know, uh, if everybody in the world did one day a week without meat, it would have the hugest impact on lowering greenhouse gases. So what if I invited 10 of my meat-eating friends over for a meal <laughs> and cooked something really delicious that was vegan um, or vegetarian, and maybe that's a nonviolent action that helps um, convert somebody to a new practice. Um, yeah, so, um, and I'll tell you that the food <laughs> at the convent in Hue uh, with the sisters, all, all vegan, all uh, Vietnamese vegan food was so delicious. I could not imagine that a person sharing that meal and also the silence while, that while we ate and then washing the dishes together wouldn't say this is a beautiful way to live you know like a this is a really beautiful way to live um so anyway i i there's just <laughs> but you you're you're on a beautiful path sarita and i um uh, the last thing so here is tiknot han and martin luther king the last time they met in Geneva at a peace conference in 1967, uh, Pachaman Terrace. And what Ty remembered of that is we talked about the importance of community. And that's what I would say to all of us. Um, we need community. And it, it's, it, you know, they could have talked about a hundred different things. Um, the war was going on and, uh, you know, the opposition that they were feeling, the despair that Ty had been feeling. And instead they talked about the importance of community. So we need community and we need to find people who uh, can share life with us and we can support and they can support us. Thank you so much. And um, luckily I, I I won't say long, but I the thing that's been amazing about this sort of refining by fire process is that I have found my comrades all of the superficial okay. friends and the phony kind of the people who are really in the trenches with me, I have found, and it's been, it's been wonderful. And it's it be, to be able to partake in Christ's suffering in this small, small way has been really, really humbling and encouraging. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, I see someone put in the uh, chat that Sister Chan Kong's book, Learning True Love, covers the story of my, the nun. Uh, and yes, I drew on that quite a lot. Um, it, it really gives the narrative um, uh, that leads up to the play. Yeah, thank you. I recommend her book too. Learning True Love is a, is a beautiful book. And, and it also talks a lot about the youth for social services. Well, I know that I've run us over. <laughs> thank you. Uh, this has been really beautiful. It's been a, a joy to be in this circle with all of you. And um, I look forward. Um, yes, I, I will be happy to sign anybody's books that they bring to me. Um, and I also am honored uh, to be in this circle with all of you. Uh, I hope we do have a chance to talk again in the future and uh, maybe meet. Um, Jess is working really hard to make some more events um, in person and online. Uh, I've, I've probably done something like 60 interviews and uh, webinar event, web events. And it's really been such a pleasure to, to meet the beautiful people who have been influenced by Ty 
and by Martin and by the beloved community. So blessings to all of you. Thank you so much, Bishop Mark. This was wonderful. And thank you all for coming together and um, creating community right here. It's very special. Thank you. Very special. Thank you all. Bye-bye.